Hello, Patrice, and welcome to the Do Good and Do Well podcast. How are you today? I am wonderful today, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. It's been a long time in the making. Yeah, yeah, it's really good to be able to have this conversation. And we've just been catching up about all the amazing things that you've been doing this week. And it's back to school. Three ones like, I'm like now. <laughs> I know. I feel a bit shocked. There's a shock to the system. A shock. Oh, absolutely. Um, and also, I have two teenagers who are at secondary school, which brings a whole level of fun at this time of year as well. <laughs> well, you are very welcome to the to the podcast. For those of for those of the listeners who don't know you, who are you? Tell us about yourself. I am Patrice Gordon. I currently reside in Southwest London. I am a Gym enthusiast, lover of food, love to travel. I um, recently started dancing. I have a little penchant for poker that I started last year. All around, they call me like the almost the personal encourager. So if you've got me in your back pocket, I will cheerlead and champion you. So I'm a massive advocate of personal development, which I guess is what brought us together. So that's who who meet who I am. My values are authenticity, credibility, and Although, like, the value is not love, but I believe in doing all things with love. Yeah. Um, so, who am I in terms of my professional accolades? I always try to leave with, like, who am I as a person? Why you do you want to have a drink with me? Not yeah. what my professional web sheet says. Um, so, I am a, myself, a multi-potentialite, which means I have an interest in a lot of things. I have become an expert in a lot of things. And I'm really good at joining the dots between those things. So my first career was a chartered accountant, still am a chartered accountant. I might got to finance director level. When I got to that level, I realized there was a little bit of a gap for me. I'm deeply structured and love numbers, but I also really love people. And when I got to that level, I realized it was a little bit more almost mechanic than it was people oriented. And the parts that brought me joy in my role was developing a really high performance team. So at that point, I retrained as an executive coach and almost set up a consultancy in the background, but really used those executive coaching skills to be a better leader and a better team player as well. And then I, my background is in aviation. So I did PwC then I went to British Airways and moved to Royal Mail as finance director. Then I moved to Virgin Atlantic. I took a step back in my career because I wanted to focus on building this consultancy business and really tapping into this other side of me. I felt like there was a gap in terms of me being true to my purpose and what that was. And whilst I was at Virgin, I was able to get involved in lots of activities outside of my day job because I took a step back and I was able to do my job very well. But that meant that I was able to leave an impact and a legacy within that organization from an inclusion perspective. And that's where I really found my voice and decided to use my voice which led to a number of things, went in a few awards. And why we're talking is because two years ago, I left my job at Virgin Atlantic, where I moved from finance into commercial. That was another pivot. And I became the commercial strategy director, leading one of the largest joint ventures across the transatlantic, which was the Delta, Air France, KLM, and Virgin Atlantic joint venture. So very big role, very like hyper-connected, very highly matrix. And I enjoyed it, and it was a lot of fun. But there was this other part pulling out to me. And in the pandemic, Richard Brampton gave me a shout out about all the work that I'd done at Virgin Atlantic outside of my day job, which was the biggest accolade I could possibly have with my high needs for achievement. But it was really around the fact that the things that are unseen, things that may be unmeasured, the things that really matter to me, which is building an inclusive environment for everybody to be able to thrive in, was recognized by the owner of the business. And from that, it really snowballed. So that was January 2020, and in the middle of the pandemic, Ted reached out to me to do a TED talk, which they came and filmed in my home in the pandemic. And from that, it really just blew up. I got an offer to write a book, an agent contacted me. I had to write a book proposal. I'm like, okay, what am I exactly is going on here? And he said, like, you, there is a real opportunity in the world to write a book around reverse mentoring because there's so much experience about reverse mentoring, which is not so positive. And your unique voice that you bring to that is able to really cut through some of that noise. And so I spent about 18 months researching and writing the book, which is why in 2022, when I saw this amazing PR plan for the book, I was like, okay, I'm sat in these like commercial strategy leadership meetings. 
And I've also got this great opportunity to like do my own thing for a bit. And I had to weigh up the pros and cons. I'd been called into that direction slowly but surely in the pandemic. I got lots of interest and lots of business from a coaching perspective and from a inclusive leader perspective. So I was doing lots of consulting as well as my day job, working basically seven days for two years. But there was a call in there. And so that's when I decided in 2022 to ask for a sabbatical, to take six months to like dip my toes in the water, see what it might look like, which obviously turned into a full-time gig. And so now I run a bespoke mentoring, well, a bespoke coaching consultancy business, which is called m which is derivative of m means to be one's best. And is focused on implementing bespoke reverse mentoring programs in organizations and women's development programs, executive coaching and commercial strategy, obviously based on my long career in commercial and finance. So multi-potentialite in that all of those different things, I struggled because I'm from a finance and it means I was all up in a box and I had to struggle to get out of that box and slowly but surely Every day I become more and more comfortable in being one of those things and recognizing that I can be an expert in all of those areas and the, 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 the joy and the benefit and the USP that I have is I'm able to bring the dots together and create things which other people maybe can't create they don't have that experience. So that's a very long-winded mm-hmm. answer, but ultimately that's all. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. That's, but, I mean, there are so, uh, as always with, with my lovely guests, like there's always so much that resonates from that that story, and so much I want to ask you. And I, w- yeah, I'd love to go for a drink with you. We should do that so then I can uh, ask the questions that I'm not going to ask you. Yeah, um, it's only got an hour, Sarah. You said so. I know. I think that piece about recognizing that it's not just one thing. I think that I I feel like there's a lot of advice out there in the world at the moment, which is do one thing, have one program, sell that, do that, because, you know, you can then focus on it. And I've always really struggled with that because I've got quite a diverse sort of background in terms of my um, employment experience. I mean, it's mostly not for profit, but it's been in education and in housing and in the art sector and you know, there have been pivots. I've been at the same point where I've been thinking, right, I really love what I do, but there's something else over here that I'm being called to do as well. And, and so for you, to hear you talk about the the strength in having all of those different experiences and being able to sort of bring them together and join those dots together and be really, like I just the confidence in that and it's saying I'm the ex- yeah I'm the expert in bringing these things together it's like that's like, like yeah it's not it's not an overnight thing it's taken some time but yeah. I can't expect other people to believe it about me if I don't believe it in myself mm-hmm. yeah yeah so true so true can you talk a little bit about reverse mentoring so I have read the book and I really recommend if you're interested in this subject read the book because what I loved about it is you know you talk about the bigger picture you talk about why it's really important the rationale behind it but then there's also really sort of micro pieces of advice and support like do it this way make sure these things are in place before you even consider doing any kind of reverse mentoring program I loved how you sort of really talked about the, the need for clarity in what the organization is already doing in terms of inclusive practice and is that enough to be able to support a reverse mentoring program because it's quite complex in its nature so yeah. anyway I could talk about you, you talk about it well yeah. and um, so for those of you who don't know what reverse mentoring is In my definition of reverse mentoring, it is where we have a senior leader who is mentored by someone who is underrepresented at that leadership team table or within senior leadership community. So what that means, it could be any of the protected characteristics. At the moment, the really popular engaging thing is around generational differences in the work. We have obviously gender, race, um, disability, sexual preference, etc. So any of those protected characteristics or Anything that is not seen around that leadership team table is what I encourage us to use reverse mentoring for. 
And just alluding to what you said there, Sarah, it's not for every organization. I don't recommend it for smaller organizations because 101 for reverse mentoring is psychological safety. And in order to get psychological safety, which for those who don't know, the term has been banded around a lot in my terms. It's really the ability to be able to speak without fear of kind of rebuttal later on down the road or people kind of challenging you or that coming out of the conversation and being used in it. So we have certain organizations and cultures where you can't really speak out and share your viewpoint and opinion because that's you just dissenting, for example. Um, or that you say something and it's been like Chinese whispers and it ends up in different parts else outside of the context in which you have spoken it. So that's essentially what reverse mentoring is. I didn't come up with the concept. Um, it was most first popularized by, it's been around since ancient Roman times in terms of having a mentor who is slightly different to you to be able to guide you through some. Because we think of mentoring as someone who's ahead of us in the race and they can impart knowledge on us for us to get to that point. But when we look at conversations and people that we're around, we can learn from every single person that we interact with. And whilst I feel like sometimes the term reverse mentoring is slightly derogatory because it's saying actually you're lower than you, therefore I'm going to learn from you and write it down. In realistic terms, unless the leader is in the mindset that they can learn from someone who is not on those same level, it does take a mindset shift. Um, so I truly believe in those relationships you learn equally. So the leader will learn as well as the mentor, the underrepresented person in this case. But I find just using that terminology helps the leaders more so get into that mindset space that they can really understand that they are the novice in this operation and they should be asking questions and listening more than they can. Yeah. And it really struck me when I was reading as well that there's such a skill in that conversation from both sides, I think, but particularly you know, that developing that more coaching approach style of leadership as well, to be able to sit and really listen, actively listen, deeply listen, you know, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. So in terms of the, when you say like why the smaller organ or bigger organizations should do it, like in, in your experience, what, what can happen? Like what is, what, what, what can be made different from reverse mentoring? I think with any form of like engagement program within your organization or any kind of inclusion, the likelihood is that the leadership team will delegate that responsibility to like a sponsor and it's their role to like bring it through the process and make sure they keep an eye on it. In my view, reverse mentoring is the only intervention when leaders have no opportunity to delegate that. And when they don't have an opportunity to delegate that, they have got skin in the game. Like they are not just reading the book, they are like embodying, they're not just daring to lead, they are putting themselves in that vulnerable position where they are putting themselves on the line to get it wrong. Like the growth mindset, I always say we can talk about the growth mindset from a, a sales and operation perspective. That sometimes in businesses, people struggle with like the people and the heart and the human perspective of that growth mindset. And so I think Monumental changes can happen when leaders are invested in reverse mentoring because it goes from of, um, intellectually understanding something to empathetically understanding something. And once you see something, you can't unsee it. So it might be <clears throat> the fact that whether it's gender pay parity, whether it is policies that un, not un, well unfairly penalise some people within the organisation, because then you know even when we're looking at like the the benefits policies that you have are benefit offering in most organizations is quite okay. It, it's getting a bit, bit, bit more modern. Like, I mean, you have like wellness benefits, right? Now, before it was like your pension, that's it. But right. now we have a suite of benefits. But when we look at the different generations in the workforce and the different socioeconomic groups, for example, there are different things that matter to different people in different stages of their lives. And so the most impact, like I, I, I have been involved in a few programs where they have change the benefits policy to account for some of the needs of different groups within that organization and that arose from initial conversation with a reverse with a, in a reverse mentoring relationship and so i think when things are faceless and like it's like the people have said hey, when you see it on a spreadsheet 
and you see the engagement survey and you see some of those comments, which you can obviously enough being involved in organizations where they go through their engagement set. They've got rationale for all of like some of the verbatim comments. But when that verbatim comment is coming face to face and you're really understanding what is beneath it, you can't unsee it, you can't unhear it. Mm -hmm. And so that plants the seed with that leader so that they can then ask some more probing questions as they choose to of X, Y, and Z, which means that, you know, where it has the leader's attention and think it, uh, we know that if it's not a priority for a leader, no matter how much the people, the employees are in up for it, it gets done unless it's not leadership I and support on there. So I think within all of that, it's, it's having the unique ear of the leader so they can put a face and a story to some of the stats that they might already know and see and intellectualize. But once they see it, they're like, well, actually, I can't unsee it. Now I understand how it impacts the person or that group. And they sense a personal level of responsibility in making sure it can move. So that's, I think that's the, the wealth and the, the depth of relationship that I'm trying to help individuals get to in that reverse mentoring relationship. So it's not just a, after this program that in the end of six months, this is going to happen. We do have like, what is there that we can say that we can implement and achieve after the program, but it's much more deeper than that. Yeah. It's really trying to plant the seed of them to like literally open their eyes so that when they're making decisions going forward, they've got an alternative with their perspective. And I guess as well that, that once you've had that one experience, you start to see other situations in a different light as well. You might start to ask, well, this data, but what's the story behind the data? I want to know more about that. So it sort of opens up the yeah. possibilities. What, in your experience, what are the things that get in the way? Like, what stops all of that from happening? Time. And, you know, people are most organizations' biggest asset in terms of, like, when we're thinking about customers. So if our customers want to have a great experience, we need to make sure that our people are happy. The happy are our people, like, you know, Richard, well, like Richard. But Richard Branson says, like, if you make sure your employees are happy, your customers will be happy by default. And I think sometimes organizations skip the employees and go straight to the customers and forget about the, like, you know, when things happen, when we're in flow, when we're like against it, it, it's not employee first, it's customer first. And I think that is what I've seen time and time again in organizations when they implement it. The default is I have to bring them back to, right, remember why we're doing this program. And do you remember what we said at the start? Like, I know we've had like new initiatives coming in. And said, no, this is important. And we need to make sure that we keep that process going, which is, you know, I get involved in programs on two ends. One, which is like a very consultative process in terms of they've got a strong team internally already, and I'm just there to advise them. And then on the other end, which is I'm leading the whole program and I'm almost integrated within the team as well. And so depending on where that lies, I need to have like which within the organization to understand what's happening so that I can almost intervene at the points at which I can see it going off least. Because if I'm not very closely involved, then I won't be able to see. But I need to call, I'm involved to help them course correct as we go through the program. But also if we can't manage to make it happen during a program, then once the program's finished, it's unlikely it's going it, to, the seeds are going to be planted deep enough for it to be. Yeah. Yeah, so it all doesn't have time. that sustainability. Yeah, the timing the and priorities. You know, pro really prioritizing it and time is priority, isn't it? Because yeah, like yeah. Are you going to create the time for it? And are you yeah. going to prioritize that time? Mm -hmm. I would say that's what I've seen in the programs I've been involved in. Because if the commitment's not there, I'm on it. I'm getting that sense. I don't actually work with those organisations because I don't want to. I don't want to put underrepresented people in a position where they are being vulnerable and sharing, and like nothing's really going to. happen. Yeah, yeah. Right. So for those organizations, I'd say it's always mostly time. Um, and also some really high performance organizations have leadership changes quite frequently. And some, my, my onboarding for reverse mentoring program can be for three months to 18 months. And that means that from the initial conversation to me actually starting to work, that's the range of the programs that I've had. And that's because of great idea, not sure we're in a place to do it right now. Great idea. We really need you. This has come up in our engagement survey from the start of the now. And it will range, but it all comes from the leader. 
and the leader being in their space where they are happy to invest the money and the time in doing it. And so when I come in, like I, I got, I still do get a little bit frustrated about the little time that it takes. But then once I do start after one of these long processes, I understand and appreciate why it's taken so long. And the fact that it's that like everything happens in perfect timing and to start a program when the foundation is not settled would not be a good start. Yeah, I agree. I really, when you were talking about that kind of customer first and forgetting about the employee and employee happiness, being, you know, enjoying their jobs and all of those things, I, I was thinking about my work in the not for profit sector and that what I often see is organizations really caring about participants, caring about their, you know, the people that they're there to serve at the detriment of the staff. So, you know, burnout, really poor well-being, poor financial well-being because people aren't being paid properly. They might not even be permanent contracts. Like, uh, so there's an uncertainty because the focus is on those people that you're serving. And I suppose a question that came up for me is it was thinking about those smaller organizations that might want to really try and improve their inclusive leadership, their inclusive workplace. You know, there, there's something about the reverse mentoring. What's the word I'm trying to think of? <laughs> the methodology, the process, like the thinking behind it. Behind it, how yeah. So I've done this with clients who are a bit smaller and I've done it in like a mentoring circle. So I bought two, like a triad, a three circle, six people. So three, two or three mentors, so people who are underrepresented with a leader from a particular area. Or we can do it in a much wider group. And that means that we just have, like, this is the coming way that I do it in those small organizations is starting with a problem state or a challenge. So the challenge that I'm seeing is that we are struggling to, well, like we have this great real estate asset in London and we have operated a flip store office policy for like three years. And we have like done everything and we've got lunches, we've got drinks, we've got like lunch and learn, we've got like casual, we can bring our dogs in everything. But yet still we're not finding people are coming into the office and we're trying to get the energy and culture of the office back problem statement let's have a lunchtime session and understand and share viewpoints in terms of what it is and what the challenge is in terms of people coming into the office what is it that we need to do or change because we listened to your feedback we saw that survey you said that you wanted more things to be engaged with we've done that we had that you bought a dog in the pandemic we said that you can bring the dog into the office we acknowledge that you have like commitments now from a whatever perspective which means that you need to start later or finish earlier we've adjusted we've, like, we've done all of that stuff but yet still you're not coming in the office so let's have a conversation about what it is that we can do as a team collectively together to be able to get to the app which is we want more people in the office and we want you to enjoy being so that's that's a good example of where I get brought in sometimes to look at that as opposed to a full Reverse mentoring uh, program yeah. is like, how see, can you help us? I'm, like, we've done this, uh, we've done everything, but yet still there's something missing. Yeah. And sometimes it takes an outside facilitator to ask those probing questions in an environment where people feel safe. That it's like, and sometimes they don't, sometimes the leaders aren't in the room and then they come in a little bit later once we've talked about it so that people feel like it's not coming directly from them. And then I kind of package it and put it together in the people ad lib as we're talking. So it doesn't yeah. seem like it's like one person that they can pick on. But some organizations where it is the more psychologically safe then people are happy to have the leader in there. And the reason why this is really important from all sides is because when people feel listened to and heard and they feel like the leader is like, so yeah, no, I get it. I'm really trying. They will do everything that they can to ensure that whatever the leader comes up with, because it's done in consultation, is successful yeah so when we talk about you know it's, it's common like if you get someone involved in the process that you want to change then the likelihood is they'll come up with some solutions that you haven't come up with before and they feel obliged almost to make it a success because they've been part of that like problems that 
execution, right? And so I think when we take that rhetoric and that thinking, I think it's incredibly powerful to bring people in as part of the decision-making process, but also it's not about throwing stones and saying you've done this. It's about getting to a point where we're all responsible for the solution. Yeah. And I think that's where, that's where I feel like organizations can be a bit schizophrenic in terms of like, what does that, what does the inclusion mean? What does belonging mean? Belonging means that we have, we feel comfortable with being in this space. We feel like we belong, we feel like we can share our viewpoints and opinions. We feel like we have like work friends around us that we are all working towards the same thing. But then some organizations say that, but then they make decisions like out of the blue without any consultation. So you're saying one thing, but your actions are actually showing something else. And so a lot of work that sometimes I get brought into is to like almost balance that out. Because like they're like, we've done this, this, and this. And like, yeah, we did this and that just negated everything else. And now we're basically starting like it's, we're starting from scratch because all that trust that you had built has now been eroded because you did this one thing. Um and so now we need to start again or we need to address what you've done in a like honest way and like hold our hands up and say, Okay, right. That maybe didn't work and that was a little bit of a rash decision, but this was our rationale behind it. And we appreciate it didn't really go down as well. It didn't meet our values or our mission that we said. So let's start again. So it just, it, it takes a lot of humility, especially when I think sometimes as leaders, we can just get really frustrated and be like, no, this is what it is. Yeah. We've got to get on. Yeah. There's it's always, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, that, that sense of safety, you know, one, if we, if we feel like we belong, if we feel like there's safety, we can be more creative, we can be more innovative and, Surely that's what we need from, you know, a, a workforce is, is those kind of, those, those skills. And I wrote down the word trust as you were talking, actually, like really building that sense of trust by there's a congruence there. We say we're going to do this thing and we're going to do it. And if we don't do it as well, we'll put our hands up and say, oh, we messed up. That didn't go as well. But it's that humanity, isn't it? As you say, that just sense of human to human. How do, how do we have this shared vision? And how do we get there in an honest and open way without people feeling they're going to be told off or picked out or, yeah, yeah. Is there anything else? Because oh, I want to also talk to you about your programs for sort of um, women development and the other bits and bobs you're doing. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about in terms of reverse mentoring that you think might be helpful? Oh, so much. A good question. I've been talking for days. Um, I would say definitely there's a few things. So first of all, like we, there's a LinkedIn reverse mentorship learnings that you can take, which is like an hour, which gives you like a nice version. And I would obviously say read the book. And we do have an audio book version as well. But the read, there's just so many different facets to it that I think the psychological safety and like you said at the start, it not being like a drop in the ocean, but being part of an overall program to make sure that individuals know that it's a supported structure and this is not just a one-off thing that we're trying to like do a tick-box exercise to get it done. That's important. I would say the recruitment of the mentors and the mentees is incredibly important. That it needs to be on a volunteer basis because especially for the mentees, as in the senior leader, it's all to do it in their level of commitment to it might be slightly lacking. Um, and then for the mentors, the underrepresented individuals that please don't just ask them, please like encourage gently, but no forcing of people to participate in the program because that will mean that they are unfairly like given the burden because it is over and above their day job. This is not their day job. And sharing who they are and bringing themselves into the room as individuals as opposed to their work. Some, for some people, it might be a little bit difficult, challenging. And then finally, I'd say like key grid for me is that depending on the underrepresentation that you would be partnered with. So this is for the mentees, the senior leaders. Ensure that you are doing the work around before those sessions. So you're not relying on this individual to teach you and educate you. Because for me, it's not about the burden on underrepresented people to tr to teach, to train other people in terms of this is what it should be. And I get a lot of kickback. I get a lot of backlash for reverse mentoring in terms of I'm just putting undue pressure on people who are underrepresented. But my main intention is to help the leaders do the work around it so that they have this one-on-one -on -one relationship with someone or just would not normally be able to have because their life circumstances or work circumstances don't dictate it. 
because if, if you if you don't know a person of difference in any of those guises, like you can't just walk up to them and say, "Will you mentor me?" Like that's really affronting. Like if you're a senior leader and you're like, do that, and and so I do feel. I do feel a softness towards these leaders who aren't in a socio-economic or a social background or a work background where it's easy for them to tap into that difference, which is why it's really important that you create this program carefully because then you're giving them a lifeline into a world that they would not have the opportunity of understanding otherwise. And so this is why I have such fierce protection over the underrepresented people because ultimately they are putting themselves out there and depending on, like, I see one view of the organization that they, they share with me, what it is like internally. Like, I have to do a lot of work to understand what that is. But I don't ever want them to feel vulnerable and exposed as a result of this program. And so it's a real delicate dance because people aren't going to understand unless they have that relationship with somebody. Even they can intellectualize it, but they won't really get it and understand. And so there's this really thin line between, like, exploiting and putting a burden on people who are underrepresented versus opening up that learning space and allowing the leader to learn but also for the individual to learn too. So that's why I say it is reciprocal because both both parties have to get something out of it. We just need to ensure that that leader has got that mindset space to be able to be in a novice position before they go into it. Yeah. There's just such a sense of care, I think, that has to yeah. happen with it. You know, you talk about dancing and the delicacy and the balance and, you know, they're people, people with, yeah, with their, all of their experience and how do we take care of everybody in that, in that process, particularly the underrepresented members of staff. Yeah. And it, when, when you were talking then, I was reminded of a piece from the, your book, which really resonated with me. It was something, I'm really rubbish at remembering detail, by the way. I'm sure you'll get the bit I'm talking about. But I, it was the piece where you were saying, it's like introducing like a new computer program yeah. into an organization. And you put, you say to everyone, we're going to do this. Or play. But you don't have the skills to do it. Yeah. So anything like coaching, reverse mentoring, any of those kind of programs, you need to shore it up with some um, training or additional support that helps people to give the, give them the skills so that they can make the most out of it. Yeah, is the intellectualization right? You can read, you can watch a webinar, you can write, be like, okay, great, this is how you do it. And see, it's gonna make my life so much easier. Do you know how many of these courses I've done? I've done so many of these courses in this entrepreneurial life. I'm like, right, okay, I am gonna just do this. I'm gonna sign up to this course, and by the end of it, it'll be applicable. And I'm like, oh my god, it's not as easy as it looks. Right? Yeah. What well, step one, two, three, but like, gosh, getting to step one is really hard. And so in all of this stuff, there's just so much information out there and it's like being, being bombarded by it. It's just helpful to be walked through. Like, this is what it looked like and have a conversation about it so that you understand you're not the only person in the room that feels really awkward about this. You're not the only, pe like when we do the training, we do the training in cohorts with so a group of mentors, a group of mentees, we do it together. They can understand, share, learn from each other's experience as they go through. And they have this safe group of individuals that are going through it at the same time that they can tap into throughout the process, you know? Yeah, so important. Let's move on to your other stuff, the other mm. stuff that you do. The other stuff in the, in the bag. What else you put in there? Yeah, look, look in the bag, pick something mm -hmm. out and tell us about it. Okay. The thing that is top of mind for me at the moment is, aside from reverse mentoring, which I eat, sleep and drink, is women's development. And the reason why it's on top of my mind is because I started off by being a springboard facilitator. So for those of you who don't know, springboard is a women's development program for people who are under management grade. And it's like a franchised almost affiliate program. So I became the first non-HR facilitator at Virgin Atlantic for springboard. And we took like... We've taken hundreds of women through it now. But my challenge was, why is it only HR people that are facilitators? Why is it not other leaders, women leaders from across the business? And so that was game changing for me. That was the first time I'd been involved in a women's only program, just to see the women share their vulnerabilities and their challenges and work together to help build each other up was like life changing for me. And so that partnering with like, obviously my coaching skills, the facilitation skills, 
and that's become like a really important pillar of my business. I am part of the Harvard Women's Leadership Board. I am part of the Women um, Women in Aerospace and um, Airline Charter, so Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter. So I'm a committee member for that, and I'm a member for lots of other women's groups. And the reason why I get so excited about it is because I remember growing up, I didn't necessarily have. I thought I was going to be the Naomi Campbell at Oprah. Like I didn't grow after eleven. Obviously, I'm not Naomi. Okay. Um, because those were the two black female role models that I saw that I thought, right, maybe I could be there. And then Oprah, still my dream. But ultimately, I didn't have those role models. And I didn't, like, growing up and becoming an accountant, like, there was no accountants in my circle. So I was trying to role model off the women and the men that I saw in that space. And so I think in society, we have this viewpoint of, like, what perfection and what good looks like. And at the moment, there's just been this wonderful energy where where women feel much more comfortable in tearing up the rule book. And I'm happily in ch- like in charge and part of that process. And the reason is we have so many things that are imprinted onto us as we're growing up throughout life. And as I've become older and like the rug has literally been pulled from underneath my feet and I've had to really reassess my choices in life, I've had to really ask myself, like, why did you make those decisions? Like, what was behind it? Was it fear or did you have faith that something was going to happen? And... As I've unpicked it, I've really understood how sometimes we get ourselves caught up in this cage in our mind of like, this is how it's meant to be without really questioning and challenges up, challenging ourselves as to why. And so part of my mission over the past, like, I'd say 10 years, 10, eight years has been when something really catastrophic happened in my life where I had to just really assess everything that happened. I had to look at myself really deeply. And I had to ask myself, like, how did you get yourself in this position? And I had to reflect on the choices that I've made. And I had to think about, I had to dare to dream again. And I had to think about what is the life, what is it, is that life that you aspire to be? Why? Like, why? Like, going back to your values of why. And I, I truly feel as a coach, you can't take people where you haven't been before. And it's literally only in the past year that I've become much more comfortable with that personal side story of mine. And sharing that in in rooms where it is I'm I'm responsible for the psychological safety and it's curated by me because I think people see this version of Patrice and there's so much that happens and has happened and still happens daily underneath. But that is a real privilege to know and that's a real privilege to share. And so I believe that by doing that in smaller groups which are curated, we can build women who are able to be more unapologetic unapologetically themselves like sharing in a safe space where like this is what I'm really dealing with underneath the surface of it all you know advertising it on LinkedIn and Instagram is not like a healthy way of doing it because you're not really dealing with it and you've just like I don't believe in feeding like negativity and drama I believe in in sharing in a constructive way that's going to help us get to a certain place and so I think the more especially senior women or accomplished women share the things that are happening underneath it gives people a more realistic idea of what it takes to be a certain way. But also it gives them a little bit of a breather. Like it is not all perfect to have you. But ultimately, when you understand some of the decisions and, and people at a deeper level, and these are people that you maybe aspire to be like, you can learn from their journey and you can take those like learnings without having to struggle and do it yourself. Mm. And so my program, which is the power to pivot, which is seven weeks long, online community of only eight women per cohort is my my gift I believe of helping women move through like the different stages of like what is it that well, like what is a pivot like, we've all pivoted but how big do you want to go what are the foundations of pivoting and why did like assessing those life choices that you make in the past the second one is like visualization where do you want to be like what is your big picture without any guardrails what would it be what what are we putting down on paper that in five years' time, this is what you see? The third one is like the psychology of habit, what the psychology of change and what it takes, like building habits and why we change the shoulds versus the couldn'ts. Like we should do this versus we can do that. Like the unfortunate forcing versus the option of possibility. And when you make decisions from that could possibility space, they're just so much more enjoyable. So you think, oh my God, I could do this. And that's, bringing me energy and joy 
I would, I said I would do this or like, I need to do this out of obligation. So it's like getting in touch with yourself to know like what is the root of that decision and why am I taking that decision? And sometimes you have to do those good ones, but you need to know why you're doing them and what the eventual outcome will be. I think sometimes we just operate in the matrix and we just go along. That means without really questioning and challenging ourselves. And I'm just trying to circuit break and give them like a catalyst and a bit of ignition around what it takes for you to truly choose your life. And then chapter four is not all but and. So exactly what I said about being a multi-potentialite, like me owning the fact that it's not an or, but I am, am all of these things. And how do you wrap that up in a story, which might not be me in tight, right, nice little bow, but you're comfortable in sharing that and recognizing, I was at this networking event yesterday and this woman was 50 and she was like, I'm starting a whole new career and I feel like I'm starting from scratch. We're not. You have a wealth of experience behind you and you are, you are connect, you're connecting those dots to be able to start from a position of experience as opposed to from zero, you know? So it's really acknowledging that it is an and because you, you don't just erase years. We're not going to go back to being 20. Like we had that experience and however we package it or think about it, there were so many gifts in that and we have to really make sure we own it. Chapter five is cultivating the next level you. So this is really around the fact that when we go through changes in life, Sometimes the circle that we have around us is not going to help us get to where we need to be. So once we've visualized, once we've like understood what habits we need to change, sometimes our circle, our friends, our friendships are not the same environment that's going to help to fertilize the dreams that you have. And that doesn't mean cut them off. Like there might be some things that you discover that you do need to cut off, but that's not cutting it off. It's just saying that you need to understand that. What do you need to get to that next level? One, I, I've, like I said, I'm a part of lots of different things and I have invest time, energy, and money in those things because I recognize if I want to get to where I need to get to, I need to be in different environments. And so that's what that's about. Chapter six, I have an independent financial advisor. He comes in and we talk about like, what's your financial end game? Because I think when people are pivoting and wanting to change in life, the biggest fear is money, especially for women. It's about like financial security and stability. You know, we've just got the right to vote. We've just managed to, we're still trying to get equal wages out there, right? But who bets? Um, love about it but it's ridiculous but for us to step off and do something like that follows like passion and follow our heart that's all great and everything but if you've still got a mortgage and you've got yeah, children exactly you can't just throw the hat in and go through it and so as I was going on this journey I had to make some really tough decisions about what I wanted to get out of my life and what I was willing to sacrifice today so that I could have enough savings in the bank for a year to pay my mortgage and have like a relatively okay lifestyle if this business didn't work out. So it's things like that and it will come to but it will go and then you that is uncomfortable. You know, as women, we find it really difficult to talk about money. Ugh. Yeah. I think it's, it's like we have to get out of that habit. We need to really step into it because we earn it and we need to earn more of it because, because we're not talking about it. We're not earning more of it because we're not transparent about it. And so... I talk about my journey and I also have this independent financial advisor that comes in and just shares really simple models for people to be able to look at and assess in their own life. Because it's quite a private thing, like to look at that and think about where it is, where is it I want to be? And then they can have a session with her afterwards to like understand like the lay of the land. And it's like no commitment, no like no risk. It's like I paid for her to join our sessions so that I can tee these women up to have a little different, bit of a different view when it comes to finances. And then week seven is bringing it all together and then cult, like bringing together the key learnings that they've had and what the, like what the how and the now it's called. So like, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? And then for six months after the program, we have monthly check-ins to see how people are getting on with yeah. it. And it's a combination of teaching. So I use like I've got a wealth of knowledge from all the books and courses I've been with. And so I start with the facts. So it's not just Patrice said, there is science behind yeah, it. Yeah. And I go into mentoring. So I say like, this is how I, this is, was my challenge. And this is what I, this is how I've done it. And then I go into coaching, which is like, this is like, share with me your challenges. Um, and then we break we um, sessions. And then there's homework and prep work for you to go into. So it's seven weeks because I couldn't get it into any less. It's intensive. It's not, you're not going to finish it and be like, okay, great. I've done. Done. <laughs> done. Pivot in is a lifelong journey, but those tools that you have, you will use them over and over. Yeah. And the community that you build, 
you're sharing such personal details with people when there's only eight of them on the board. So mm-hmm. it's nice because you had these people who were on this same journey, like in different yeah. ways. Yeah, the power of group. Yeah. That sounds amazing. So it sounds amazing. So we've got a cohort starting in October and I plan to run one per season. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's my thing that's given me lots of joy at the moment. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, the, the results are amazing. But the most, import, the most important thing is community and building that as you seek to advance yourself. So it's for women who are ready to just stop, stop making excuses and really own like what is what it's going to take for them to get do that work yeah yeah I mean there's so much that you've just said I totally you know that really speaks to me about not having different people in your life as you're growing up who are doing different jobs I remember at school like a friend of mine her mum was friends with a teacher and I was like wow can you imagine like having a friend that's a teacher where was my mum yep well um and exactly what you were saying about you know that that program and why it's important and often what comes up in in my coaching is a recognition that we've been working to these rules and we're not quite sure a who invented them how they got there like you know in in certain organizations like well this is how things are done it's those invisible norms that have sort of arrived and then you're like oh do I have to do it like that do meetings have to be like this every time just because they've been like that the last 20 years or is a leader it, it, it what a leader looks like does it have to be like this can't it be something different can I yeah rip up the rule book and do it in my own way like and that's I love those moments in coaching where just that recognition of going oh hang on a minute how did we get to this point why um what yeah why why are we doing it this way that's the other piece that really spoke to me was this there was the intimacy, the small groups. I think there's such power in 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 that. I think you know it can help feel it can feel safer. Um, but also you really then have those bonds between people and can really strengthen them. I've been on programs where there's so many people on the call and I I'm a bit of an introvert in many ways and so I tend not to speak up if there are too many people I won't I'll just listen I'll sit back and I'll listen it's, it's personal like you're not about to blast your business on online where we were just having this conversation beforehand where we run these events and then people are asking you for the recordings but when it comes to coaching and deeply personal mm-hmm. stuff I'm not comfortable in sharing that with people who are almost faceless and they're able to hear the stories of these other wonderful people who have been mm-hmm. vulnerable enough to get on the board and share. So it's a real delicate thing. It's- mm-hmm. And again, it's that care. I think it's taking care because we're working with people and we're working with people's lives and we're working with their thoughts and their dreams. And what's your responsibility? Yeah. And, and I also love what you said about the finance piece because that's the bit when I've worked with freelancers often. You know, we do a lot of that vision, you know, what is it you want your life to look like? And then also like, okay, let's think about the money situation here. What What's going on with your relationship with money that's stopping you from getting to where you want to be? Or, you know, really like simple things sometimes. Like, do you have a bank account where you're, you know, the invoices that are paid are coming business into business. a business bank account and not into your personal bank account? Like it can be like... Just that practical sometimes, but I think it's so important and we do need to talk about it more. We do need to have better relationships with money and know that we get to do that. We can, we, we deserve to speak about it and it doesn't make us greedy or horrible or mean or whatever it is. It makes us savvy and knowledgeable. And so, yeah, that, that really, I was like, yes, yeah, I didn't have that. Come on. In terms of, like, say so for you, if we think about, like, you, you know, your vision, like, what would what would you love to see in, in the world, business world, inclusive leadership, and what's your part in that? Yeah, big question. I've always, I've always questioned what my part is. Let's start with my part. So I think that I have been uniquely called to use my gifts to straddle between the hard finance, commercial, coaching, human way of leadership. So sitting around those leadership team tables for with heavy stuff, with heavy like number stuff, 
but then also having this really personal and very high EQ. I think my, my USPs that I join them together really well. And so people accept, respect and listen to me because of that background. I'm also incredibly intuitive and in touch with that EQ side. And I was going to say soft, but it's not soft. It is a real no. new skill, right? So that's where I feel I have a role. And whether that's it, one of the things I've been challenging, where, where does that sit? Does it sit where I am right now, running my own thing and like trying to take over the world? Or does it sit back in an organization, where I've got a role with, with people, responsibilities, and it is commercial and I'm living and breathing it. Because I think that's how I became who I am because I was living and breathing it. I wasn't in a HR people role. I was in a commercial finance role and I was living and breathing inclusive leadership. And so my wish and my dream is that we don't, we don't contract out that people aspect to the HR team, but that leaders of those revenue generating parts of the business. So the commercial operations, like all of those, like, or engineering, all of those hard parts of the business have a leadership style, which is inclusive and true and daring and courageous. So they're not just offshore outsourcing it to HR team, like can you come in and run this program? My dream would be that actually more departments are calling for like HR to almost sit within their function and guide them as the conscience of the organization, which is what I believe they should be. But oftentimes we know that HR is not necessarily that, but the, that outside in approach, so as I said at the start, organizations who truly lead and manage for their employees, trusting that the customer, exceptional customer journey will come as a result of that because you've hired the right people who are on the same mission and you are cultivating a culture of belonging, which means that everybody has skin in the game or making the business a success. Real from the dream. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm beside you. Let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. Crack on and rest as well. Um, uh, so, okay. So for anyone, for organizations that are listening to this, or people working in organizations who are listening to this and they want to know more about what we've mentioned, you've mentioned the TED Talk, you've mentioned the book, and you talked about a LinkedIn learning. So LinkedIn learning. with credentials is on LinkedIn learning. So please check that out. Anything else or anything no, else do you want to kind of point people to the direction of or? No, I think LinkedIn is probably the best way to connect with me. You can see the rap sheet on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me if you're interested. The website is www.mnair.co.uk, which we'll put in the show notes. But it's also, yeah, just if you want to have a conversation about inclusive leadership, building like your women's development program or executive coaching, then yeah, please reach out and let's have a chat. Yeah, and I'll make sure all of those links go in the show note as well. We, we've covered quite a lot in this conversation. What for you has stood out, resonated, you want to go back to? I think it's, it, it's been covered a lot, but it's been very integrated. And I think that when we look at inclusive leadership, when we look at reverse, reverse mentoring, is just a form of inclusive leadership. Yeah. And so this has been a really timely, nice conversation to remind me of sometimes I feel like I'm like this. And I'm like, I don't know who's going to watch it. Uh, I feel like I'm spread out. And actually this has just brought it back to the core, which is that that is what I'm about. Um, but also the, the power of that story that we read through. And sometimes I can canter through and really skip the story. And so I was at this thing last night and everyone was like, yeah, but you just skip through that. And I was like, yeah, I know. But they're like, well, no, that's really interesting. Like, let's tap into that. Let's dive into that a little bit more. I think maybe I've... I get, I get to the point quite quickly, like, let's get to the point. But actually, when we are doing this work, people really are actually more interested in the story behind it than the actual outcome sometimes, which is, you know, I'm like, I know it's out, I'm oriented. What is it? Let's get to the point. And other people are like, well, no, we just want to get to know you a bit better. We want to understand that story a little bit more. So the questions that you ask are really insightful in regards to actually what is it below and underneath it, as opposed to. These are the stats and the fact. But thank you for reminding me now. Yeah, I, I, I feel that too. That that storytelling, and also sometimes it's really. I find myself repeating my story over and over, and it's quite boring. Like, no, I'm like, like, oh, 
God, who wants to hear this? And get, it's like going on LinkedIn. Oh, oh God, God, why do I have to do this? And 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 so there's something I don't know. I, one of my questions is how you keep that fresh and alive for yourself. Because actually, it, when you're growing and you're building your community, there are people coming into you that don't know that story. Oh, yeah. Do I have to keep on saying it over and over again? Yeah. I find it really difficult, Sarah, if I'm honest with you, because those who are my cheerleaders and are in my camp, I don't want them to be fed up with me because they're the ones that's been me all the time. And But then I also have that duty to grow the message as I've been sent as this messenger for this, these messages. And I'm, it's remiss of me not to do that so I don't I would say to you I find it quite difficult because I feel like I'm repeating myself all the time but actually in the past few weeks I've got to the point where like social proof is very important in this space and so I've hired a social media agency that's the way that I'm getting through it because that's a big thing for me it's a big investment but also I recognize that I'm my best when I'm able to like be playful and yeah. like from the heart when it comes to like LinkedIn and Instagram and being in person and some of the stress and pressures of like the repetition and doing things over and over again pulls the joy out of it for me and when it takes the joy out when you're not doing something for a place of joy it takes longer for you to do it but some days that like, when I'm not feeling like inspired it takes me three hours to write a LinkedIn post three hours and I've allocated half an hour for it how did it take three hours right whereas this morning I was full of energy from the event last night it took me like half an hour yeah. to write that Straight to the point. And that's probably, that's the post that probably get more engagement yeah, than the one that you took three hours. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. 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 Separating that out and getting a social media agency who's going to help with the foundation and the, the blocks of what we need to play with this algorithm of ours. Yeah, yeah. Different things. yeah. And then so I can focus on like the really fun stuff and the engaging stuff and the videos that post the videos. You're going to see lots more of face to videos from me because apparently that's what the algorithm wants. So I yeah. don't think I'm completely comfortable with it, but you will see, hopefully, the Irish will be a bit awkward to, like, be an inflow at some point in the next... Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, I'm looking at getting some support around brand and social media because there's, there's also, I think, when you're running your own business, you, you get stuck in the story and you feel it, but one of my struggles is sometimes articulating it. So I, I'm kind of thinking, if I have someone coming in and looking at it from an external perspective and saying... That's the bit that resonates. That's the bit you need to highlight. That's the yeah, bit. Where I was screen changing. I've got my agent is obviously a, J, a, a Gen Z. He, he was like, he was like, in my opinion, I was like, can you stop saying in my opinion? Just give it to me straight. I'm an adult. I can take it. He was like, Patrice, you talk way too much. Like your form, your your content is way too much long form. Like you need to get to the point. And so I was like, fair, fair comment, fair comment. I was like, I was telling people the story. And they're like, no, it's too long. People don't have the time to read that. So I'm like, okay, I'm taking that feedback on board. So I think it's just like you said, like we're in our heads quite a lot when we do yeah, work. We think yeah. it's, like it's really thoughtful. It's not. And then you're like, I don't really want to hand that over to someone. My voice, I think it's our voice. But it has been very humbling to pair of eyes on this one. I think you do need that. And it goes back to what you were saying about, you know, thinking about where you want to go, whose support do you need to get there? And when you are working on your own in your own business, really asking for that help and in prioritizing it and investing time and money in it will help you to get where you want to go if you keep doing the things that you've been doing before I ain't gonna get the same result it's been so lovely to talk you've mentioned how people can get in touch with you i'll put all of that in the show notes is there anything else that you want to add say talk Just about thank mention you so much for inviting me and to let everyone know that we actually found each other on Female Founders Rise. Yeah. So we did the LinkedIn challenge. Challenge. And Which you're doing this. again. You can do it again. I think I'm, I may do it again, but... Yeah. I'm doing it again. I need, I, do it. I need the accountability. I need the... Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So it's just the power of connection. And we met on, on a Zoom call and then we followed up with each other and then we had a ball before summer mm -hmm. we just clicked so yeah. yeah just the testament to to just ensuring that you're not just clicking connect with people on linkedin and you're really taking the time to get to know and invest mm -hmm. in those relationships there's been wonderful things this can happen exactly oh thank you thank you for sharing your time with us look after yourself you too thanks sarah <laughs>